Good morning. Welcome to Christ Church. We are so glad that you are here. If you are tuning in online this morning, welcome. If you're in the room, would you like to stand and worship the Lord with us this morning? Let him turn it in your favor. Watch him work it for your good. He's not done with what he started. No, he's not done until it's good. Hey, watch him turn it.
morning. You can have a seat. Well, it is ugly Christmas sweater Sunday, which is fun. Thank you to all of you who pulled out those ugly sweaters this morning. And those of you that didn't even realize you were dressing for ugly, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. But it's going to be a fun Sunday. I hope that you will enjoy a cup of cocoa after service out on Main Street uh, with all the fixings out there. You know, it is Christmas season which is a season of giving and receiving. We give and receive gifts as part of family gift exchanges, as well as maybe giving and receiving gifts with your spouse or significant other. And as I think about giving and receiving, it reminds me of generosity. And if you will permit me, I want to share with you just a little bit about my journey with generosity just before Karen prays this morning for our Christmas offering. You see, when I was a young Christian and just starting out, um, I bought into the lifestyle of generosity. I knew what God expected of me. But every time an opportunity came up, it felt as though I was giving something that I had earned. Something was going to be lost when I gave that gift. And it felt like that for a long time. It felt like it was a transaction between God and I. And then somewhere along the way, Every time an opportunity for generosity came up, it stopped feeling as though I was giving something, and I started focusing on more on that which I had already received. See, the truth is, I see my life as every good thing has already come from God. And so when an opportunity for generosity arises now, I can't help but remember what I've already received. And so as Karen prays over the Christmas offering this morning. I encourage you to pray along with her in your hearts, but I also encourage you to ask yourself, is this about giving or is this about what I've already received? Thank you, Jake. Sorry, I don't have a ugly Christmas sweater on. I totally forgot. I'm not good with that kind of stuff. But I'd like to pray for our Christmas offering. Heavenly Father, we just love you and we acknowledge that you are the sovereign God of the universe. This world and everything in it belongs to you and all that we have is a gift from you. We're just mere stewards of what you've given us. I know, as Jake said, it's not easy when we're buying gifts for family, friends, um, giving to other things to open our, open our hearts and our minds to giving more resources. But Father, pray that you would help us and teach us your spirit of generosity. Grant us a burning desire to worship you by giving freely to this Christmas offering so that others might be blessed and learn of your love. Today and in the coming weeks as we contemplate what to offer and present our offerings to you, I pray that you would stir within us a bold spirit of generosity and that we would remember what your word tells us more than 2,000 times. And these are just a few. To whom much is given, much is required. It is better to give than receive. That one who is gracious to the needy lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay him for his good deed. Help us to trust in your promises. I love that you even ask us to test you by bringing our tithes and our offerings into the storehouse to see if you will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing that we cannot contain. Lord, I have experienced this. And I am just in awe of you. I pray, Father, that everyone here today would have the courage to trust you, to test you, to freely give without compulsion what you have laid on their hearts to give to this Christmas offering. And that those who are going through dark seasons in their lives may see your light and be blessed through the generosity of this church. And to you be all the glory. In Christ's name, I pray. 
I want to remind you there are three ways to give. You can give via our Christchurch app. You can give at ChristchurchOhio.org. You can give this morning to our general fund in the black giving envelopes in front of you. And to our Christmas fund, there are Christmas offering envelopes out on Main Street at the Welcome Center. Now let's stand and worship a little more. Yo 
Asa <laughs> might not prevail, but his wife and four daughters might. So, <laughs> so we asked him to stay home, and I'm his partner, and I've got his back, so we're going to do this together today. Amen? <laughs> My daughter, a couple weeks ago, they sang this song, Closer, and in it, they talked about... Um, uh, she talked about her story, like her, why this song meant something to her. And what happened was when she was uh, in labor, it went way longer than expected, and her blood pressure was high, and it was um, over a full day of just hard labor. And I went ni home the night the baby was born, my beautiful granddaughter, Sela, and I felt... Um, an overwhelming amount of joy, but at the very same time, I felt like ill for my daughter. I was worried. Does all the mama's hearts know what I'm saying? And I, I, I sat down, and I, my husband was gone. He was at his friend's house. They were doing hot tub cold plunge or sauna cold plunge. We'll get to that later. But um, I, I had some time alone, and I... I have a playlist that I play. It's my worship list for 23. And I put the worship list on, and I just, I literally physically got on my knees, and, sorry, and I just was thanking God for what he did to this baby. But at the very same time, I was asking for his help. You know, in life, there are things that it's at the same time. There are things that can be very, very true. That we are in great joy because I have this granddaughter, but I'm also a little scared because my daughter, I just want God to help her, fix her, make her better, bring them home, and life is good. And a lot of times in life, there's these, there's these two conflicting ideas. And I think oftentimes we kind of lean towards one or the other instead of living in the reality of both. And I've been thinking so much lately about all the things I've taken for granted. Like, I just beat my body up in my 20s. I would be like Burger King, <laughs> McDonald's, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I wouldn't work out. I would just like, I just took it for granted. But now in my 40s, <laughs> I'm realizing, you know, things are a little stiffer. Things, things need stretched out a little bit. And I was watching this health guru, and he was talking about when you get over 40, there's certain things you've got to keep your body doing because you want to keep yourself from losing muscles. And so I was like, okay, I'll be doing these things. And my house, my family kind of makes fun of me because I'll be like, I'll be lunging because and you're going to lose, you're going to lose mass and then it gets harder to jump. And so I was like, can I still jump? Like, can I even jump? I never jump. And I was like, I was doing all these things to try to like physically take care of myself. But at the same time, struggling with like all these sicknesses. Like in last year, my New Year's resolution was, I am going to get healthy. And health was the focus. Church, I have never been more sick in my entire life than this year. I like every sickness you can I think my dad's sick because I think I actually gave it to him. I I everything you can get and if you saw the amount of stuff I was doing, I'm drinking this green powder every morning with 75 minerals and all the good stuff and and be honest, there's a lot of moments when I've asked myself, is it worth it? There's a lot of moments where I've asked myself, what's the point? There's been moments where I was like, forget it. DoorDash McDonald's. And I have more moments like that than I like to admit. Because I've taken things for granted sometimes. I was recently learning about um, it was like years ago, and I think there's like this scripture, I take it for granted. I, I see this Bible, and we can go to any online store, and we can order a Bible. And it's bound, and you, you get your name put on it in gold, and, and it's all together. And I grew up with this Christian family that we would 
hear about the stories in the Bible my entire life. But sometimes I would think of them as fairy tales. Sometimes I would think of them as like, that's a, that's a cool idea. But is it true? And I grew up my, in my life taking the Bible for granted because anywhere you go, you can get it. We can download it on our phone for free in our language. And we take this for granted. And I was in my late 30s and I heard a sermon. I highly recommend listening to it. It's Andy Stanley. And it's called Bible for Grownups. And in part one, he talks about a little bit of how the Bible was actually formed and what people went through so that all these years later, we can put it on a shelf, let it get dusty, and take it for granted. And church, I want to tell you, this Bible, it's not a storybook fairy tale. I want to tell you that Years and years and years and years, thousands of years ago, people witnessed something so powerful on earth, they had to write it down. I'm a firm believer, like when you look at uh, the different books of the Bible and you study when they were written and you, you look at uh, Luke. Luke writes this gospel and he just has to tell about the account of Jesus Christ. But in the very beginning of Luke, it says, to the great Theophilus. Luke was writing a letter to a man who maybe was high in status, whose name was Theophilus. I don't think Luke actually knew at that moment how powerful his letter would be for all of the generations to come. But he was writing a letter to this man trying to get him to understand how great, how big, how mighty, what happened on earth that God came to earth to find you. And then Luke writes the book of Acts, and he tells everything that happened after Christ was born or died. And, and you, you see that these, these Christians, there was persecution along the way. Church, I am a wimp and a baby. Someone says something me and mean to me, and I'm like, oh, my feelings are hurt. These Christians went through so much more. I'm going to talk about one of the earliest persecutions, but before I get there, you know, this Bible, there was this, there was a persecution, and it was, um, has anyone, is anyone on TikTok or Instagram? Come on, young people, come on. I say be a grown-up and watch your, your TikTok reels on Instagram. You know what I'm saying? That's what grown-ups do. If you're young, you get it. Okay, listen. They, they were as a joke that said, how often, you should ask your husband or the men in your life, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? And I was like, is this really a thing? Men, can you just, do you think about the Roman Empire a lot? Is it like a thing? Yeah. <laughs> okay. They said yes. So it just, I never knew this was a thing. So if you think about the Roman Empire a lot, here you go. In the Roman Empire, the, the, um, the, the people in charge, they really did not care what you believed in. They didn't care what gods you worshipped as long as you would pay your grain offerings to Caesar and you'd pay your grain offerings to their gods, they would leave you alone. But they were a very superstitious crew. And this superstitious crew believed that if, if there was a famine or it was dry or bad things were happening, that you had to blame someone and someone needed to be punished. And oftentimes, in this, in this time, about the third century, they would blame the Christians. And Emperor Diocletian, he comes up with one of the most strict, harsh persecutions that have ever happened statewide. And he does this persecution for the Christians, and here's what it looks like. There will be no assembly. You cannot get together. All the churches and stuff, they need to be burned down. He said that uh, if you're a bishop, you need to recant that Jesus is the one true Lord and give homage to Caesar. And if you didn't, you would lose your life. And one one of the hardest things was every ounce of Christian literature was to be burned. Now, you have to understand, at the time, it wasn't like you would be burning a copy of the Bible. 
the Bible did not exist yet. There were letters from Matthew, there were letters from Mark, there were letters from Paul, and they had been meticulously copied, and they'd been passed down. Like your grandma would tell you, I knew John, I heard him speak. And here's a letter that the church has. They would be passing around maybe one or two books of the Bible because this did not exist yet. It was just people meticulously copying what the original word said and trying to get it to other churches. And now Diocletian is saying, it all must be burned. You might have fragments of a letter. It must be burned. And people like you and I believed so much in that letter from Luke. They believed so much in those letters from Peter and John that they, they did everything they could to protect what we now know as the Bible. But at that time, it was letters. And what would happen is they would interrogate you, and if you didn't give it up, they would kill you. They would kill your, your daughter, your son, your wife, and then you. And people gave their life so that we could hear and know something of the magnificence, of the beauty, of the mercy, of a grace who loved us so much he came from heaven to find us. We don't have to find him. He finds us. And they gave their life and I want to tell you that as we talk about this passage today, I want you to know it's true, that it's real. It's not a storybook. It's not a fairy tale. But there is a God in heaven who lived, who came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ. And his life was purposeful. His life was powerful. And his life changes ours if we can just step into the reality of who he is. If we can step into the reality that sometimes persecution happens. You know what shocks me the most is during this time, this where Diocletian said it's all got to end, Christianity grew. And it grew and it grew. Because at the same time, when the enemy thought he had him, Jesus said, you are mine. And now earlier, way years, hundreds of years earlier, the disciples have seen Jesus die. They've seen, they've seen him rise from the dead. And it's not a story. It's a true life event that now their lives are shaped by it. And now we get to see in the book of Acts how they are living because of it. And in Acts 12, you get this, you get this pain and this beauty. In church, I want us to know that there are times that God is going to do things that we do not fully understand. That life is going to bring events that can hurt, that can challenge, that can shape. But when we step into the truth and the beauty of who God is and we keep going, we do not let the enemy have the final say, but we say, Jesus said that I am his, so I am going to keep going there is a beauty and a dignity in life that nothing and no one will ever give to you. And in Acts 12, it kicks off, Acts 12, 1, with a good persecution. Not good, a great. It was like a, a horrible thing that was happening. And this time it was Herod. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This would kind of been like the first real, true blow. James is now dead. One of their own is dead by the hands of Herod. Most likely they beheaded him because it says John, they killed John with the sword. And when Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, 
intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Church, I don't know about you, but sometimes I can have lackluster prayer. Sometimes the events of my life, I can be exhausted, I can be tired, I can be overwhelmed, I could, I could be struggling to believe, and my prayer can be lackluster. But I want you to see what happens in and through the church when they come together in unity and earnestly pray together. There is power in unity. There is power in together. There is power in earnest heartfelt prayers. I woke up this morning and I was just like unsure of preaching and like what it was going to look like today and I, 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 I got on my knees because I started to like go scramble and, and I was like no. I am not alone. It says that I am a vessel but I am filled with the Holy Spirit. We are not alone. The power of God lives inside of us. And so instead of hustling and trying to scramble, I got on my knees and I just spent time with God. I just spent time trying to say, draw me closer to you, Father. I surrender. I want to do a good job. I want to be prepared. I want to do all the things. But more than anything, I want to honor God in my life. More than anything about saying the perfect stories that make it all come to life, more than anything, I want you to know of the reality and the goodness of Jesus Christ. And so I surrender to you. I pray earnestly that you show up. And that was my prayer. And I, I think about this church in this little room, this house, and in this little room, and then praying earnestly. Now, when Herod was about to bring Peter out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. I just have to stop for a second, because do you notice what, in verse 6, what is Peter doing? The night before he's about to die, what is our brother doing? He is sleeping, church. I can't even sleep on a good night. You know what I'm saying? let alone knowing that the next morning I am going to die, Peter was sleeping. It had nothing to do with his circumstances and everything to do with the God that he followed. Peter was witness to all of it. Peter had moments that, that I think haunted him. He had moments where he denied Christ, but then he encountered the grace of Christ. He encountered Christ saying, do you love me? Then let's go. And after Christ dies, you see Peter in a new light. You see Peter step into a life of destiny that he has been born for. You see him step in courage and faith. And now Peter's kind of like the preacher for the gang. Peter, in the, the book of Acts, you see him. He speaks up boldly. When they're, when they're doing different places, Peter will preach. And now the preacher has been in prison and most likely going to die. And Peter is asleep. And not just that, he's asleep between two guards. Have you ever had to sleep in between something before? I, when I was little, my mom and dad, I would love to crawl into bed with them, but they had a water bed. You know what I'm saying? 80s parents, the water bed. And when I was sick, I would crawl in between mom and dad and the water bed, and I'm telling you, it took about one second before I got hot. Before I realized, like, their body heat was now suffocating me. And I didn't feel good, but now I'm stuck in between mom and dad in the water bed. And I was struggling. And I just tell you, I never went in between mom and dad again. I was like, it's too hot in there. It is too hot. But sometimes we're stuck between. Sometimes we're stuck between what we know is the right thing. 
but something that might feel right. Sometimes we're stuck between making a choice that's benefiting others or making a choice that benefits you. Sometimes we are stuck between, do I keep following? Do I keep doing the right thing? My daughter, Taylor, she's um, the healthiest, happiest, beautiful, joy lady on earth. And she's been uh, struggling with anxiety, and she's never struggled with it a day in her life. She, it's like her sophomore year in college. She's interning for the church. There's like a hundred things going on in her life that are hard. She's got a job. And, um, and she's, she's been doing all the healthy things. I'll see her get up. I'll see her take that green powder and drink it. I'll see her go work out. I'll see her spend time with devotionals. And she's still, it's like she can't catch her breath. Have you ever been there? You can't really get the big breath in. And I sat down next to her this week, and I said to her, I said, baby, no one really tells you this, but sometimes growth feels like death. No one tells you that when you're doing all the right things, and you're, you're studying, and you're trying to get better, and you're trying to grow, and you're learning, that it actually feels absolutely horrible. It feels more like hell. Can I get an amen? amen? And I said, so I want you to keep going because this is a season of growth if you allow it this is a season of growth and i know it feels hard i know you want to catch your breath but you keep doing the right things and you keep doing the right things and then one day what you're doing right now is going to feel easy just keep going it spoke to my heart just keep going Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. Thank, Je Thank you, Jesus, for the light and darkness. Amen? He struck Peter on the side, and he woke him, saying, Get up quickly, and the chains fell off of his hands. Church, there are, there are times where we're going to have dark nights. There are going to be times when it feels like we've kind of maybe even imprisoned ourselves with terrible thinking, with anxiety, with overwhelmed life, with loss, with pain, with, with the feelings of maybe it's just like I feel mundane. I feel like nothing's worth it. It just is boring. But like Katie preached last week, dry bones hear the word of the Lord and live. I have prayers in my darkest nights. Father, let there be a seed of light in the darkness and let it shine, let it break through and let me overcome. Church, sometimes we need to pray, let there be a seed of light. Let there be a seed of light in the pain. Let there be a seed of light in the hope so I can keep going. Let there be a seed of light because the enemy thought he had me. But Jesus said, you are mine. I'm going to do a side note here because I think it's important. He struck Peter on the side and he woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. My dad and I do a podcast. It's called Grotential. And the whole idea is just as we're growing and learning, we want to share with you. And we do 20-minute podcasts and we're doing one on happiness right now. So it, it comes out at the end of every month. So the first part one is already out and part two is going to come out next week but next week's christmas so it'll come out sometime next week but in this podcast we talk about the paradox of happiness is you the more you chase and pursue happiness actually studies show the more depressed you become and so there's an indirect form of what you pursue to actually truly become happy and so if you are interested go listen to that but in it Dad talks about this idea that shaped me as I grew up in my life, and I want to share it with you today. He stood up, and then the chains fell off. Church, so much and so often we are passive. I get in fights with my husband, and I wait for him to make it right. Ladies, amen? <laughs> Just kidding. 
kind of. I wait. There's, there's something hard going on with my kids, and I'm like, can they figure it out? Can they figure it out? Like, too often we do this life passively. But we do not follow a passive God. And what my dad says in this podcast is he says, in every relationship there has to be a champion. In every relationship there's got to be someone who says, I will go first. And I decided a long time ago that, that I would do that. And by the grace of God, I think my husband decided the same thing. So we're constantly pursuing each other and we're constantly trying to make it right. We don't let passively our relationship get unhealthy. Together or whatever, you need to choose that if there is going to be a time in your life that there is going to be a champion and that champion is you. Because sometimes you have to get up and then the chains fall off. The chains didn't fall off, and then he got up and went to work. He got up first. Church, we cannot be a passive church. we got to be a church that pursues the younger generation. We have to be a church that pursues Christ with all of our heart, that pursues unity and oneness and pursues a relationship with God. Because we're not just the church in here. We are the church in the world. You represent who Christ is in your workplace. You represent who Christ is in your friend's relationship. You represent who Christ is to those around you. And sometimes you got to choose, I am going to be the champion so that I can make a difference. I will not passively live this way. Peter goes. He gets up. Chains fall off. He thinks it's a dream. Because you'll see there's a lot of this happens in Acts. Like, they'll get visions and stuff. And this has happened to Peter before he's had a vision. So this is happening to him, but he actually thinks it's a vision. And he goes and he, he gets out of the city. He goes to the place where all of the disciples were praying. And he knocks on the door. And this little girl comes to the door. And she's so excited to see Peter because it says they were earnestly praying for Peter. And now Peter's knocking on the door. And she's so excited, she takes off. She doesn't even answer the door. She just takes off to go tell everybody. And the, the people that are praying, I'm guessing would be the disciples and some of the followers, and they're in this room praying. They say to her, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. Peter's not here. She's like, no, Peter's here. Peter's here. And meanwhile, Peter just he keeps knocking. have a hunch that in the very same room they were paying for Peter they prayed for James and I just wonder what does it take to keep knocking when you've seen the worst happen what does it take to keep moving forward when you honestly know the pain of life. It takes really, truly knowing that you follow a God who is trustworthy. That in life and in death, I choose to follow and believe because he is faithful. Because time and time and time again, in the heartache of life, he has proven himself true. And I know that if I just keep knocking, if I just keep going, that he will show himself true. In this book I was reading, I shared this before at CC Midweek. It's um, this, this Discovering Soul Care. And in it, the author talks about... Um, like how you have a vision for your life and how you move forward. And it's, it's a great, small, short read, so I do highly remember, recommend it. Discovering Soul Care by Mindy Caliguire. And in it, at the, towards the end, she talks about this, like there is a reality in life that God is good and hard stuff happens. There is a reality in life that I've seen pain, but I'm still going to hope for the future. I, I can't just sit in it. I have to keep 
knocking. And in it, she says, they, they uh, interviewed a group of men and women who ran. And in this group, they said, um, they ran marathons and stuff. And they said, when you really want to quit, what makes you keep going? And she thought, is it the crowd cheering you on? Is it like you know where your family is and you're going to go make them proud? Um, is, it, is it the training that keeps you going? And the crew said, no. You just take the next step. You just take the next step. She said the true glory moment in life is not the finish line. The true glory moments in life are when you feel so angry that you can't even stand being around someone, but you choose kindness anyway. That's a glory moment. She said the true glory moments are when you fought addiction day in and day out, and you finally say, not today. That is a glory moment. The glory moments in life are when you know the pain, when you feel tired, but you say, I am still knocking. I am still hoping in you, Father, because I want to draw closer. Even though I can't see the way forward, I am trusting in you. And church, I call you for glory moments. That there is the good with the bad. That in life, we do have to choose. And here's the truth. We've been chosen. Christ found each and every single one of us. If you are here, you are not here today by accident. God chose you. And I call you for these glory moments in life when you feel like giving up. When you feel like it's just too much to move. Step in to the glory moment of God. At the end of chapter 12, Peter is alive, but Herod is dead. The enemy thought you had me, but Jesus said, you're mine. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a mighty and a powerful and an awesome God, and I just want to give you all glory and all honor. I don't want to be a church that's fake and doesn't address some of the hard stuff. It's real life, and there are things that are tough. There's the beauty and the pain, and there's the good with the bad, Father. But in it all, you are writing history. In it all, you are, you are growing your name. You are growing souls. You are calling us to you, Father. And I pray that in this season, in our life, we will hear you call us. I pray that we will know you, that we will follow you, and we will just keep knocking. In your son's mighty name we pray. Amen. give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you your breath.
this idea of an active faith. And Sarah's 100% right. There are times in our lives where the easy thing would be to just sit back and hope that it comes. But I know in my life, when God has shown his grace to me in the most powerful ways, They weren't times where I was just sitting back waiting. They were times when I stood up, I put my stake in the ground, and I said, I see a need here, and I'm the guy to fill it. And that's where God has given me the greatest blessings in my life. When my marriage has been in some of the toughest spots that you can imagine, God did not bless it by me sitting back pouting. He blessed it when I said to that woman, there is nothing I won't do to fight for this relationship. In my career, when I wanted to take the next step, God did not provide me with the blessings by sitting back and waiting. It took courage to go to my superiors and say, I see what this company can be, and I'm the guy to get it there. No matter where it is in your life that you're looking for blessings, I want to encourage you to actively pursue them. Stand up, put your stake in the ground, and let everybody know that you're the one to get it there. It's going to be scary. You're going to feel like you're on an island. But here's the truth. God's with you every step of the way. And what better battle partner is there than that? This week is Christmas week, and so I want to invite you back to our Christmas Eve services, or our, I should say, Christmas services this year. So we have a Saturday night service on Saturday the 23rd here at 5 p.m., and we have two services on Sunday morning on the 24th at 9.30 and 11. 
So I hope to see you there. We have some cards printed that you can invite a neighbor. Maybe that's your stake this year. Maybe it's just inviting a loved one or a neighbor to our Christmas weekend services. Before you go, let me leave you with a blessing. May the love of God the Father, the favor of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Have a great week, church.